We're honored to have two, uh, ma uh, three amazing panelists here, all gay men, all living with HIV. Uh, we're going to follow the spirit of this film and be very candid and direct with each other and with you. Uh, first of all, of course, it's my honor to introduce you to the screenwriter, the author, the playwright, the rabble rouser, the troublemaker, and the founder of the Ned Weeks School of Outrage, Mr. Larry Kramer. Very shortly after the timeline you see, saw depicted in the film, Larry went on to found, co-found ACT UP, um, the most amazing uh, feat of uh, public uh, advocacy uh, we've seen in the modern age. And if you'd like to know more about that, you should watch the Oscar-nominated documentary, How to Survive a Plague, which features prominently the great work of our next panelist, Mr. Peter Staley. And then finally, another longtime advocate for many years who founded Paz Magazine, who was one of the first uh, political candidates openly living with HIV, who wrote his own history of politics and the epidemic called Body Counts, and whom I refer to lovingly as the George Bailey of Milford, <laughs> Mr. Sean Stroop. So Larry, obviously, I, I, I have to start with you, and I want the other panelists to jump in at any point you feel, you feel like you, uh, you'd like to. There's so much that washes over us watching this film. I'm wondering what it's, the experience is for you, as many times as you may have seen it. Do you feel the same anger and emotions watching it now? And uh, do you, or do you re recommend, remember the personal stories of those very real people? that you wrote of uh, in this film and in the play? I actually haven't seen the film since um, <clears throat> there was this, I, I was in the hospital when they were making part of it and they took me to HBO to see it before it opened and I haven't really seen it much since then. And uh, I have to say I think Ryan did just a wonderful job. And, and the actors were also brilliant. I, I was particularly taken with how, how a great Julia was. Uh, she wasn't the obvious choice, uh, but Ryan had worked with her and one other. Um, but she really nailed it. Um, I only should look as good as Mark Marfalo. <laughs> It's, uh, ben Brantley of the Times, uh, in reviewing Harvey Firstein's revival of, of, um, Torch Song. of Torch Song, said last week that he had expected it to be just a sentimental uh, bit of yesterday and found that the play had more meaning today almost than it did then. And he said the same thing. He said, it's just like normal heart. When it was done uh, earlier on, no one would thought it would go on, but it's, it's uh, more to need it now than ever. I'm very proud of, of, of this. Um, it's hard not to be overwhelmed with the memories of, of all that. Um, it actually has stirred up my fire to be uh, I haven't been as anger, angry publicly as I have been then because I've been working on part two of the American people, but we are in such trouble as a population, gay people right now, and we're getting on drum, dumped on right, left, and center by just about everybody. And every everything that Trump does 
and every one of your points has just vomited out all kinds of hateful things for us. And it's just worse than ever. And I feel uh, we're not prepared for it now any more than we were in 91. I still don't see enough of us out there fighting. United, visible, it's like we've all taken a vacation. We have the AIDS drugs, leave me alone. And, and meanwhile, they are creaming us again. And we're much too passive about it right now. Those are themes in, in, in the film, those themes of the tension in the gay community between we just want to have a good time versus we have to pay attention to this. I feel as if everything all is new again, that we are still revisiting these things of, of the gay community trying to just get on with the, the get on with gay marriage, get on with uh, uh, carving out lives for ourselves uh, in an environment in which we are more and more at in peril. Than, than we even realize. Exactly. It's impossible to separate age from politics, isn't it, Peter? <laughs> it always has been. Um, I uh, remember the first time that I saw uh, The Normal Heart. It was the revival at the Public Theater in the late 90s, is that right? The first revival. It was well. Yeah. Um, and I got to know Larry in ACT UP, um, but I came to New York in 83, which was almost uh, the last year of the history that you saw in this movie. Um, and I was, uh, I was fresh out of Oberlin College. I had just got hired by uh, J.P. Morgan. I was a, a, a very closeted uh, bond trader on Wall Street. And um, after seeing The Normal Heart, uh, after I had done 10 years of activism with ACT UP and, and uh, been part of the response that Larry always wanted from our community, um, it made me, seeing this early history that I didn't know, it made me furious. And I, I, I think that's the, the response you, you want us to be angry. It made, it made me furious that in 83, um, closeted gay, young gay men throughout the city knew nothing about this history. I mean, what you, this history you saw on screen happened in a little bubble that nobody saw. Um, less than 10% of gay men in New York City were politically active. It, it, only they were hearing about this. The mayor was saying nothing. Uh, uh, Reagan was saying nothing. There were no warnings for the closet case, the young closet cases among us. Um, and we heard none of this history. Uh, and like, like young people are, we were able to compartmentalize uh, the, the scary things we were hearing about these you know, a few hundred cases at, at that point, that they were happening in older gay men who were highly promiscuous and we didn't have to worry. It's very much like the young gay men today, uh, 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 their, their HIV avoidance strategies. Um, so, uh, very frustrating and very infuriating that this history wasn't known while it was happening. Um, and um, I'm, I'm glad that the the community finally found its voice uh, when ACT UP was formed in 87, which is three years after this f uh, history ended. Um, it took us way too long and far too many died because our community responded so slowly. But when we did, we roared and we finally got the country's attention. Um, it was a get it back. Right. Larry would be the first to tell you that his he one of his disappointments was how ACT UP fizzled out after a period of time, and that you would like to see that same activism and anger going on today. You see remnants of it in Rise and Resist and a lot of the anti-Trump movement. 
Rise and Resist is a small New York organization which is in the right place, but not enough of them. When ACT UP was really working, we had chapters all over the country, all over the world. Um, and uh, it made a big difference. And the organizations we have now are not making a difference. And we are not holding them accountable for not making a difference. We are not joining with them to help them make a difference. And um, we have a lot of entrenched AIDS bureaucracies, AIDS organizations that uh, have just become bureaucracies. I don't know. I don't know what it is about people that they won't fight for their own lives. I've had a, a terrible couple weeks because um, uh, someone I had some professional interaction with um, died of AIDS at age 43 and I couldn't understand why anyone and he was educated and had money and all that was dying at that age. And that it's still possible to happen. We're trying to piece together why. Was he in denial? He had Kaposi's legions on his face and nobody, nobody said anything. He had, he, it turns out he had Kaposi's legions in his lungs um, and that had been there for, for quite some time. How does, that, how does that happen with all the drugs we fought so hard? Um, anyway. Sean is the answer, or is the easy answer, HIV stigma. The fact that people are so terrified to face it, it, even to go get tested, much less even be treated once they're tested. I haven't had a good friend three years ago who died of new assisted pneumonia like it was 1986 because he was so terrified of being tested that he didn't allow himself to be, and he died as if it were, you know, the mid-80s. Uh, I think in the specific case that uh, Larry's referring to, I think stigma was a big mm -hmm. part of that. I said I think stigma was a very big part of this, the reluctance to get tested, the reluctance to address with it. And I think HIV-related stigma is much worse today than it was during the period this film depicted. And people often find that surprising because you look at the film and people remember when you had to wear a space suit to see someone in the hospital and people were afraid to breathe the same air or to eat in a restaurant that might have a gay waiter and so on. And those are, that's a fear of casual contagion, which is certainly a component to stigma. And that is lessened today as people understand more about what actually transmits HIV and what does not. But stigma as experienced by the stigmatized is much more nuanced and complex than simply fear of casual contagion. It's about people making a moral judgment about your worth when they find out you have this virus. It's about being marginalized and othered. And very importantly, and this is where the, the really sad uh, death that Larry referenced, it's about a self-stigmatization, an internalized stigma, which uh, today a diagnosis is much more lonely than it was years ago. There was a robust LGBT community that accepted the epidemic as a collective responsibility. There was an AIDS community that when someone was diagnosed, there was a, people wrapped their arms around this person with love and said, we will get through this together. And today, when someone is diagnosed, they are on their own, their, their life changes in ways. Uh, they keep it a secret because they're concerned about the effect on their career, on their social standing, on their housing, fear of partner violence, uh, fear of losing custody, their children. Um, and a lot of this changed, I and mean, this is the, the irony that today when on the biomedical side, an HIV diagnosis, a person can expect to live a normal lifespan if they have access to treatment. 
many people basically have absolutely no effect on their physiology that they can detect after a diagnosis. So when we've had such a profound success biomedically, why is the stigma so much worse? Um, and uh, and I, there are a lot of reasons for that, but one of the ones that I really point out is that in the earlier years of the epidemic, people saw people with AIDS through some prism of sympathy. They saw them through their likely death, regardless of whatever moral or religious concerns someone might have. They saw people with AIDS as people who were suffering, who were ill, who were probably going to die, possibly a horrific death. And so there's some degree of sympathy in that. But once effective therapy came out and people began to understand we're not dying, we're actually going to live, we started to be seen through the prism of that potential survival and living longer meant we would be around longer to potentially infect others. And so to the public health system and the criminal justice system, uh, we became seen as an inherent threat, a dangerous population that needs to be sought out and tracked down and identified and tested and listed and reported and regulated by the state, controlled in various ways and ultimately criminalized. Uh, last week, uh, uh, the wife of the recently departed Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tom Price, uh, his spouse is a member of the legislature in Georgia, in Georgia. and uh, a hearing she had a discussion musing about quarantining people with HIV and whether that would not be the most effective uh, prevention strategy. This is last week. You know, we dealt with quarantine at this time as well, uh, when um, uh, Proposition 64 in California was on the ballot to quarantine people with HIV, and for much of that summer in 85 or 86, it was ahead in the polls. We ultimately defeated that. Uh, so that's an answer to stigma. I, I, think, I think stigma is, and stigma is not unique to HIV. It's about stigma as it's sort of hardwired into how we respond to people and to others. You know, the, 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 the apathy that we sense to privilege is the parent of complacency. And at a time when we were so terrified of dying and it was so real and so all around us all the time, it was a lot easier to mobilize people because they were genuinely angry, they were genuinely frightened. One of the tactics in the we film didn't mobilize that many people. Act up was it was great, but we we were not that many people. I get um, I get impatient with words like stigma and internalized homophobia and, and things like that. Everybody suffers from one unhappiness or another. Everybody. You're sounding like your brother. Huh? You're sounding like Arthur. Arthur who? Your brother. My brother. Uh, Hold that mic closer. Uh, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, the only thing that works is anger and visibility and, uh, and sticking together as a people, which we but not doing very well. <clears throat> you rail against people, uh, your character in the movie about not coming out. Why were all these people closeted as gay men? If more people came out, then we would have more visibility. Can the well, same be applied? Well, out now, and we don't have that kind of visibility. We, did, we wasn't, you know, hundreds, of, there wasn't a million people, I mean, a million women went to Washington. We're a million gays going to Washington. Um, we are not visible, and they are creaming us. And the things that these candidates are saying, I mean, it's the same for every, every minority, but this is the minority that we have to deal with. It's just appalling. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be legal to, to, to defame people because of whom they love. And so I, we have to be angry as a population, and we're not. 
And that's our great tragedy, I think. When you talk about coming out, I wonder if the same can be applied to being HIV positive. Should more people who are living with HIV be more open about the fact they're living with HIV to gain visibility and, and fight stigma? But the truth is, is, is that this epidemic is no, well, it, it, it never really was simply a gay epidemic, right? And it is, it, it is, it we, is we, didn't, we didn't know that originally. Right. We didn't, we were told it was gay, and volume two of The American People, my novel about the history of gays in America since the beginning, I have found such unbelievable history of how long HIV has been in the world and how much earlier than the 80s there was a plague of it that had started already in Africa and we were not informed of such by any of the World Health Organizations by the by 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 the National Institute of Health, whoever, and they knew about it, shit like that. I mean, let's talk about a population that other people really wanted to get rid of. And the more I get into the history of our fight, the more I see how awful these people were who worked for Reagan and around Reagan and, and the two Bushes and their people. Um, and, uh, and the hatefulness of the things they did to us. And of course now it's, it's only perpetuated by, by the drug companies who are getting away with only murder. You shouldn't, it's evil, it's evil. It's evil to have a medicine that can save people's lives and, 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 and they can't have it because they can't afford it. And although gay men are still being yes. accept that that is evil and fight back with the kind of fight that evil must be fight. I can't believe they're asking us to wrap it up already. I know there's another uh, viewing in a moment, so should we give at least one audience member a chance to uh, ask a question of anyone on the panel before we start wrapping it up? Really, now's your chance to stand up and get angry. Yes. When did that first article appear in the New York Times about those cases of HIV? Was that 1981? The, the first article was in July of 1981 in the New York Times. Yes. And you'll notice that the, the timeline of this, of this uh, story is so early, you'll notice you never hear the word HIV in the normal heart. It hadn't even been identified as a virus yet. yet. Anything you'd like to add, Peter? No, uh, thank you for coming out tonight. This is a great